he who shall become. All right? Son of man, that term was used for one purpose. Genesis 3.15. Remember when we studied Genesis, the third chapter? At verse 15, what does that mean? What, what does that mean? And that's the promised seed. All right? Now, we know that the... Uh, now, Enoch in his writings, if you want to study that, you can also see that on discovertheword.com. He doesn't call... Well, he does refer to Jesus as the Son of Man in a few places, but most of the time it's the Son, the Seed of the Woman. And corresponding to the promise that, that the Lord made, that Jehovah made to Adam and Eve in the garden. Because... <coughs> God decided in eternity past, over here on your little chart, in eternity past, that He would, through mankind, and this is before mankind was ever created, but the world that would be alienated from Him through the merits of one that would be related to Him that would be, that would be Adam, through the seed of Adam, that he would absolutely bring back into harmony all things in the universe. That's how much God loved you. He didn't do this with angels. He didn't do it with dogs or dolphins or whales. But he did it with mankind. And he decided that he would make mankind in his image. Okay? And doing that... <coughs> God knew that, that Lucifer would rebel against him. Lucifer was, uh, and we're going to study about that. We're going to study about Satan in here also. Lucifer had a, uh, a glorious job, didn't he? What did he do? Lucifer means what? Light carrier. Light carrier. What was his job? Worship. Bill. To oversee the earth. Oversee the material creation of God and lead out in worship. He was the... Was on the leader. <laughs> he, he was he was Gary and and and, uh, and not only Gary but he was uh, John yeah. all in one. He was and this, this is the angel that led out in the whole chorus of the world of the universe in worship to Jehovah. Well, God made him perfect. Now God created everything that He ever created with a that was a, a cognition that could recognize and communicate everything that could communicate. He gave a volition. Free will. A free will. Now we can get too far on that stuff too. You know, all the way over to Ar Armenia's son. <laughs> Go too far with that situation. Okay? But everything that, that he created with a will, he created with, with consciousness, he created a will in. And we even see that in animals to some extent. Because the serpent in the garden was cursed above all other animals and because of what the serpent did in the garden, he loaned his body to Lucifer or the one that became the, the Satan. He brought in to the curse on all animals because of that. And we find out that in the millennial reign of Jesus Christ and in eternity the future, snakes will still walk on their bellies. Because that curse is not going to go away. All the way. But everything that's been created has a volition. Okay? It has a volition. Christy, this is what we're going to start studying next week. There you go. Preview of coming attractions. All right. Yes, sir. This is, I don't think you can substantiate this in Scripture, but what do you think about, well, all the animals that are on the earth today, will they be in the, in the New Jerusalem and the New Earth and that? All the extinct animals, the dinosaurs and all that stuff, plus the new ones that God has in store for us, will they all be there? I don't know. There are things that, there are instances in Scripture that maybe they will be. It doesn't maybe every true. animal that ever lived, will be. there'll be room for them someplace. Oh, yeah. Really, to tell you the truth, but... If it doesn't tell us, we got to yeah, we just don't yeah, know. That's, that's one thing. That, I knew you couldn't find the Bible. That's not what, yeah. what you thought. It's possible. It's possible that, that animals will be there and, and uh, uh, yes, Brother Libby. I think, I think that the first third animal, I don't know. I think they would just make for, 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 the, for a certain time 
for a fuel system. You know, for I really believe process. that, brother. I believe that the prehistoric animals, the large animals, that that were, I believe God put them on the earth, and when the Lucifer destroyed the earth, they became the fossil fuel. Mm -hmm. I believe that. Mm -hmm. I mean, that that was a purpose. That was, his, you know. God's unpreventable progress. He foresaw what Lucifer was going to do, and he allowed it to happen, and now we have the Middle East crisis because of it. Yeah. Well, all of these, one thing leads to another. It's just like a stair step leading up, okay? And, and in history, you can study these things, okay? Now, the Son of Man question. God decided that he would be related to mankind and related to all the other creation to redeem all of creation back to himself by the merits of the second Adam, which was Jehovah in the flesh. All right. See, that's, that's the whole thing. At some point, I think Jesus referred to himself as Son of God after a certain, I don't know if it was after his crucifixion or his ascension or some time in there. But I, I spoke too fast when this guy asked me who was who do I think the son of man was I said Satan and uh, and I, I wanted to back up and research this and go back to him and tell him that you know I knew I spoke too fast at that time. But, but Jesus I said the wanted, son of man will will die. He called himself the he, son. he said that he would die the son of man. He's the second Adam. Alright? The second Adam was perfect. He was a God of heaven. That's what the Bible said. He was the son of man. Now, the son of perdition, the son of hell. Now, there are sons of mankind that Genesis, remember? Now, who is going to be the ultimate son of man and the person of Lucifer? The Antichrist. All right, now, will he be of human blood? Yes. Will he be of Satan? Yes. Well, that's why we, we were talking about the, uh, the <coughs> prophecy thing. And yeah. That was what was in my mind when he asked Well, me see, every mind. time God does something, Satan imitates it. Okay. He's copied yeah. Every time God does anything, Satan imitates it. And he uh, absolutely uh, uh, tries to make a fool out of God. And so many, well, when the Lord founded his systems of belief, from the beginning of time here, Adam was supposed to worship God in a certain way. When he failed, willfully mm -hmm. failed, all right, what did the son, the first son he had do? That was the son of the flesh, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. All right, well, you'll find in the Bible also the rejection of the firstborn. Now remember that term, the rejection of the firstborn. When we're born in the world, God rejects us, rejects our first birth, doesn't he? Because that's a that's a birth into sin. But we must be born again. Okay? Now, many times in the Bible you'll find the firstborn that was rejected in the Bible. Every firstborn uh, animal in 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 the nation of Israel now, I'm not talking about in the world, but every firstborn animal in the nation of Israel, what had to happen to this animal? Sacrifice. It had to be sacrificed or it had to be redeemed. Okay. Because he said the firstborn was mine. That firstborn's mine. All right. Mine. And not only it's mine, but it's accursed. What does the word accursed mean? It comes from Alabima in the Bible. Alabima. Alabima. Comes from Ada and Tiffany. Ada means what? Um, and Tiffany means to place. To place up. In the ancient temples, I'm talk, not talking about Israel at all. I'm talking about in the ancient temples of times of old, because this is where the word Anathema comes from. Where does it, where, that's a Greek word in it. Where did the Greek language come from? Persian. Well, well it, 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 it came from Alexander the Great's time and, and before that, but it came from the ancient Greeks, okay? The Ionians and Athens, <coughs> that's the, the word Attic, Ionia. That those those are from Athens and, the, and and Ionia. The Ionian culture. They were pagans, weren't they? And so much of the language that we have has a, a pagan origin to it. The term ecclesia. Alright? And the term 
on a thema. Okay, now the word on a thema are accursed. It means to place upon the wall. And how many of you ever had a uh, family heirloom? Have some in your family that's a family heirloom that's really valuable and everything. Well, somebody up in your family, they just up and decide, well, you know, this is a family heirloom, but we're going to dedicate this to God. We're going to take it to the temple over here, or to our pagan God. We're going to put it in the temple because this is really important to our family. And in the, in the temple, everybody who walks in the temple is going to see our family or something or our family on the wall in these pagan temples. So it was uh, dedicated to these pagan temples. Once it was dedicated to a pagan temple, you could never buy it back. It could never go back to the family because it was dedicated to that God and to that temple. Okay? So it is, what does it mean? Unredeemable. That's what the word accursed means. Unredeemable. It could not be bought back. Okay? Once it was dedicated, it couldn't be bought back. Back. Now do you see how beautiful the love of God is? Because of sin from our father Adam, we're all dedicated to hell. Right? But through the person of Jesus Christ, we can be bought back. Now Paul says, at one time, uh, he says that I would wish that I was on a theme of. I wish I was cursed and sent to hell and, and unredeemable for my nation, Israel. I would take their place in hell if it was possible. That's how much he loved them. But you can't be saved for your children, can you? Mm -hmm. You wish you could, couldn't you? You love your children, you wish you could take their place. You would, it, 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 they're going through life, they're going through hard knocks in life, and, and you wish that you could take their place. But you can't. But God did take our place. He did take our place, the suffering and, and the hell that, that we should uh, have to face. He took upon Himself on the cross of Calvary. And that's the God of the universe, the Creator. The creation crucified the Creator. And He allowed it. Not right? What a, what a sign of love. What a sign of love, Brother Kim. The, the, back to Anathema, uh -huh. was last week you talked about the kinsman redeemer and that they would give all their stuff to the temple so they wouldn't have to be the redeemer? Is no, that the same kinsman, type of thing? No, no, this is different. <laughs> this, what, the, yes, it was. The, the Pharisees, many of the Pharisees, Korban, that's the term, Korban. Okay, you remember this, Brother Lee? Korban, that term, Jesus condemned the Pharisees and the scribes and Sadducees for using that term. <clears throat> Families, when they when you had children, the children were supposed to take care of the family, and especially the firstborn son was the heir of the family, and he also was the heir of everything that the family had. But what else? He was the one that was supposed to take care of his mother and father when they got old, and to usher them into the kingdom of God. You know, I mean, keep, take care of them until they died. Well, some of the rascals in Jewry devised a way to get out of the responsibility taking care of the mother and father. And they devised this thing that they would dedicate all of their wealth when they died to go into the temple. Building of the temple or the repair of the temple or whatever. And they called that korban, a gift. That's what it means, korban, a gift. And Jesus said to those rascals, he said, you, he said, you, he said, you devour widows' houses. You starve to death the elderly. And you say, Korban! And you get out of your rightful responsibilities and say, I'm dedicating everything I have to God so I can't help my mother and my father and my family. Because they were kinsmen to them. So there is a very wicked practice we have. All right. That was a wicked, wicked practice. All right, any other questions? Any other questions? That old brother John? <laughs> Good to have you.
Next week, this is our 150th lesson in God's eternal purpose. Next week, we're going to start on this. Do you have one, Lee? Yeah. You've got one. All right. You don't have one? Yeah, no. Everybody needs to have one of these, and the ladies are just as important. All right. <laughs> I'll get some more of those. Anybody want to start that next week? Do you have, John, do you have a question? About what? He is. <laughs> what is the meaning of life? I don't... <laughs> Dios, Zoe, which one? You can answer, you can answer <laughs> all my questions. I'm happy. <laughs> do, you, do anybody else have a Bible question today? We're finishing up our God's eternal purpose. Last week we talked about the second coming and the different aspects of that. And uh, <clears throat> we had a, a person that wrote in and asked about some questions about that, the different things about Matthew 24, remember? We're talking about second coming, about the destruction of Israel, and nationally, and God set aside the nation of Israel, and He will gather them back together again in the last days. And we see that in, in the chart up here. We we start out here with the division of the earth and the confusion of the languages. We know that's when God divided the earth. We have a promise here. God chose one man in the whole earth whereby that he would bring forth the promised Messiah. Who was that guy? He was called the Exalted Father. What was his name? Abraham. Abram. Not Abraham, but Abram. Okay? That Eve on the end means what? Elohim. Hashemayim. What's that Eve mean? Plural. Plural. <laughs> all right? So, all right. Now, Abram. Exalted Father. The word Abba in, in Hebrew means what? Father. It means actually means Daddy. Papa. Daddy, Daddy, Daddy. You know the, the, the Oriental mind was that the, the child when it, uh, uh, when it the first syllables that a child <clears throat> would speak would be the name Father. And when a child and, and they go, the little kids go, blah, 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 like that. Well, see, Abba, 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 Abba. That would be the first syllables that this child ever spoke. And so they said, well, that's got to be, he's got to be calling for Daddy. Not Mama now. <laughs> he's got to be calling for Daddy. So there's where we get the word Abba. And Abra. The Am on the end, that means exalted or up, uplifted. And then when God changed His name to Abraham, it meant the exalted father of a multitude of many. Okay? And of course, Abraham is our spiritual father in, through Jesus Christ because uh, the seed would come through Abraham. Alright? Well, God, we're, we're recapping a little bit of this. God called out this man, and he had a son. And his, his son's name was Laughter. Isaac. Okay, and then Isaac had twin sons. What were their names? Esau and Jacob. Now, who, what was the promised son? Jacob. Who was the firstborn son? Esau. What do we see in that? The rejection of the firstborn. Curse. All right, the cursed one. All right. Now God says in several places in the Bible, Esau I hated, but strong adversity in conjunction. <laughs> but Jacob I loved. That's a real weird statement, isn't it? Esau I hated, but Jacob I loved. Does God love all sinners? Sure. Not Esau. <laughs> <laughs> Are you sure? Well, God loves those sinners that come. And he, God calls every man to salvation. And I don't believe in, unli I don't believe in, in limited atonement. The Lord Jesus Christ died for the sins of all mankind. John Absolutely. Mm -hmm. First John 2 and 2. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's real important one, 1 John 2 and 2. He is the propitiation for all man's sins. All mankind's sins. But 
in the end, some won't come. And those he hates. And Esau, because they're of Esau. Mm -hmm. They, Esau is a typical, a type of the firstborn. Isn't he? You cannot come to God born of Adam. You come to God born of Adam, and guess what? You're condemned. Alright? <coughs> and Esau is a type of the first birth. Didn't he? So what does God say about that? Again, Esau I hated, but Jacob I love. We see this many times in the Bible, don't we? The rejection of the firstborn. Okay? Now, God rejected Esau. But Jacob, the second born, he chose. Why? Why did he do that? What kind of guy was Esau? By the way, Herod was Esau's descendant. He was on the throne of Israel. All right? But what kind of a man was Esau? And all of you know enough about the Bible to give you an answer about that. So kindly selfish individual. He was what you call narcissistic, self-centered. He justified everything he did because it was important to him. We call this, there's a woman that, that, that uh, propagated this theory. Her name's Ann Rand. Have you ever heard of that person? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> she says no matter what a person does, if it is for their preservation, it's okay. It's all right. I don't care if you starve your children, sell them into slavery, whatever you do, it's okay. As long as you are preserving number one, numeral uno. So that's all right. Well, that was Esau's idea. Esau's whole philosophy of life. I'm the most important person in my life. Now, the psychologists tell us that when a person's born in this world, they're born extremely selfish. Have you ever had a little baby that wasn't selfish? <laughs> they don't care what time of the day or night it is, it, but it's time to, for them to eat when they're hungry or they want to be held or they just, their little eyes popped open, they want attention. Not only do they want attention, they demand attention. Because they don't care how you feel. I mean, Mama may just really be in bad shape. And Daddy just, <coughs> he's been working 18 hours, he just got off of work. And that kid goes, ah! Right now I want somebody's attention. That's selfish. Well, as the child grows <laughs> up, they say the child should start to begin to love its mother and its father. And it should maybe feel like it will neglect its own needs for mama and daddy because they're more important than it is. Then also, later on, it decides that brothers and sisters are real important, if it has any. We live in a world today that's so selfish, people don't have children. You know what? That's really, that's, that's selfishness. They're so self-centered again. You see that, brother? It's real prevalent here in America. People are so in love with themselves they won't even share their lives with their children to propagate that God told us to do. Well, a little child uh, begins to love and if, if brother or sister is hurt or something, they're, they'll even uh, uh, get, be in danger. Hello, brother. How you doing? <coughs> they'll even sacrifice their safety for brother. Somebody comes and picks up, picks on little sister and, and the brother goes out there and this guy's a big guy and he'll stand in the way and get away from my sister. And then they have friends. Later on in school they, they, they have friends and they'll, they'll stand up for their friends. Esau never got out of the infant stage. Did you know that? Purely Adamic. Think about that. Purely Adamic. And God said he hated him. 
How many people in the world today are like that? How many people's own welfare mean more to them than society or anything else? Why, there are countries in the world that, <coughs> that only an elite amount of those people have anything, have a, a, a sufficient lifestyle that's above poverty. The rest of them are slaves to that society. This is Esau. What happened in Egypt? In the Mayan culture and the Aztec culture, all of these cultures, all of these cultures, how, what did they pivot upon? Selfishness, selfishness of the ruling elite. Or just study it in history. It's, you know, I mean, you wake up, well, I mean, start, we'll start rolling once you begin to understand some of this stuff. And the culture that Esau founded, what kind of a culture did he found? egotistical, patriarchal systems among the Arab world that we see today. <coughs> Women don't have any rights in there at all. The children, I mean, it, 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 how many of you have been over in those countries? It's, it's pitiful. I went, I went into, uh, into the land of uh, Jericho, down to there, and we came up to this other little city just above that, and uh, we had a, I was kind of being the interpreter, because I could read Greek and Hebrew and all that stuff, and I was reading some of these old ancient pillars and different things like it, and they said, Jim, come here, tell me what this is, that, that. This is 1975 and 76. That was a long time ago, so some of you weren't even born. Then. But <laughs> anyway, we were doing this, and we came up to this one area, and this, and, and this Arab, guide said to us, he said, when you get out of here, he said, if you got the safety pin, pin your pockets, sew your pockets shut, don't put anything here, nothing up here, no pencils, no nothing. He says, make sure everything you've got secure. And you're going to see a bunch of little children that are maimed and blinded and everything. And he says, don't give them anything. Please don't give them anything. Because they were maimed and blind by their parents, so they were <clears throat> beggars. They broke their legs and twisted them around backwards, their arms, and, and uh, poked their eyes out, and, and uh, all kinds of stuff to them. And then put them out to bay. How many of you would do that to your child? But if you had Esau's intent, you wouldn't, would you? The narcissistic. And ran. Whatever's best for him, the world's best for me. So now do you understand why God rejected Esau? And he chose Jacob. Jacob was a scoundrel, wasn't he? <laughs> but he wanted God's stuff. He wanted to be the priest of the family. Esau didn't care nothing about that. Only about what he could get, get you know, what he could get. We see that, we look down through history. We see the promise. We see that the Abraham's children went into Egyptian bondage. You know, how many of you ever heard of the world stories of how, how Israel got out of Egypt? The world, I mean the history. What does history say? Some of the historian histories say how Egypt got out of, out of Israel, or, or Israel got out of Egypt. The Exodus, yeah. I mean, that's, we, we see that. We see the uh, we see the Exodus, and we know that it's a historical fact, don't we? Huh? It happened. What do you think that the Egyptians say about the Exodus? What happened to the Egyptians during the Exodus? They got plundered. They got plundered, didn't they? Plundered, humiliated, thrashed. You know what one of the Egyptian reports say about that? It says that the Egyptian gods were so mad at the Egyptians 
that they started absolutely condemning <coughs> everything that they did. And the Egyptian gods brought plagues upon their land and made them get them heathen people out of their land. <laughs> but, but this, is, this is historical. If you go back and you study Egyptian history now, they said that the Egyptian gods, Ra and Amentep and all these gods were so mad at the Egyptians for allowing these rats to stay in that land that they started bringing plagues upon these people. And they said, and they forced them to get rid of these Hebrews because they say they were the lowest form of human life. <laughs> that they were, they were scoundrels. They, 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 they were just, they, they ate their children. And to get your children too, if you didn't watch out. This is what they said. Another thing that, 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 you know, Israel went out and, and they made it over there so far and they had to sit down and rest because of the what? The Sabbath day. Some of the Egyptian stories say, well, those people were so sick with venereal diseases and things that they went so far and they had to quit to recover. <laughs> That's what they say. But now what does the Bible say about it? what happened down in Egypt? There was a contest of the gods. There's only one god, we know that. But all the gods of Egypt, God challenged to show the world for the rest of history and the rest of time that he is the he is the Elohim. He is the Jehovah. He is the El Shaddai. He is the Jehovah and they say he is all of the Jehovah titles. There's about twenty of them too, by the way. If you look in your Bible, look at those. He is the all powerful God. That there may be so called little gods come up against him in time, but he can thrash them when he gets ready to. You know, we're living in, uh, in an age right now that, that, that uh, the devil is in control of it. I mean, we, we are. We live in a world. We live in a, in a nation here that, that in our schools, basic your basic education is anti-God. It is. I mean, really. What do they teach your children? That there is no God. And they teach your children, basically, the philosophy of, uh, of evolution. That man evolved from little forms of life. And at the very most, that some alien came here and put this form of life on this earth and evolved. Not God, but some alien. <laughs> They're not going to admit to anything about God. There was a, uh, a term that Joe, how many of you ever studied the history of Josephus? All right, history of Josephus. That's one of the oldest histories. And Josephus lived during the time of Jesus and, and wrote down about the Jewish wars and things that happened back then. And uh, uh, the most that they'll teach in the school today is eudaimonia. Eudaimonia. At that period of time in history, uh, they were known as good spirits and bad spirits and good luck and bad luck. And if you weren't good, you would have bad luck. But if you were good, you had eudaimonia. All the little gods were in favor of you, all the little spirits out there. We get a word de demonia, a de demon from this. Okay, Good demons, good spirits. All right. So, the Greeks can understand Josephus. He says, the good spirits were with our people. We weren't really bad people down there in, in Egypt and, and all throughout the rest of the world. Uh, the Greek and then the Roman culture, we find out that once Israel got into the, the land of promise, that uh, they were conquered a few times, weren't they? <coughs> what happened during the Babylonian 
captivity and the Assyrian captivity. What happened to Israel? Why? God's judgment on them because they weren't following his rules. So God used other nations, wicked nations at the time, wicked people to, to <coughs> whip his children to get them back in line again. You know that, that God couldn't get the, the, the idols out of Egypt? Did you know that? How did God get the idols out of Egypt? I mean, I mean, out of Israel. <coughs> Babylonian captivity. The Babylonian captivity. They didn't have any idolatry when, when God brought Israel out of Egypt, He couldn't get the idols out of their hands. Even when He brought them into the land, they were still idolaters. Mm -hmm. Finally, God deported them into Babylonia, and they saw so many idols, it made them sick. So finally, they wouldn't have anything else to do with idols. I mean, they only wanted to worship the one true God, except they may have a problem they may begin to worship the Word of God. <laughs> and kiss it instead of, the, instead of the God of heaven. I remember one time, I was really poor when I was little. And now and then I got something for a treat. How many of you like butterscotch? Mm -hmm. Anybody likes butterscotch? How about chocolate? Mm -hmm. Things like that. Well, when I was a little kid, I got a taste of butterscotch once or twice. Somehow or another, I don't know how it happened. Because <laughs> we sure didn't have any around there. Anyway, my grandfather, actually my great-grandfather, I went over there and raked his whole yard up one day and all kinds of stuff, and he gave me a dime. And I said, boy, I'm going to go find some of that stuff down at the store. So I took off down the store. I was about six or seven years old. And I went down the store and I saw this stuff. It was butterscotch. And it was a dime. A little jar of this butterscotch. So I bought this jar of butterscotch and I went home and I opened that thing up and I ate that whole jar of butterscotch. <laughs> <laughs> to this day I haven't eaten any more butterscotch. <laughs> I was sick of it. <laughs> I didn't want any more. That was all it took. All the time I was eating it, it tasted real good until it got about to happen. You know, it wasn't that big a jar, a little jar like that. But after I got down about halfway through that jar, it didn't quite taste so good, but I wanted it so bad I ate it all. <laughs> I was sick. God couldn't get the idols out of Egypt until he, or Israel until he put them in the Babylonian captivity. He made them sick of them. And that's where they also started their synagogue services, where there was ten Jews in any area and they could have a synagogue where they could worship them and kind of play temple. Okay? Well, <clears throat> down through all the captivity, finally there was a, a nation that rose up, Alexander the Great. He was going to unify the whole Western and European <coughs> Asian world over there. He wanted to conquer and conquer, and in about 14 years he conquered everything he could conquer. And he called, he Greekized everything. He, uh, the whole world was speaking common Greek, or the, or the language of that whole world, it was Koine Greek. The whole world was speaking this language. And even the Jews translated their scriptures into Greek. And that's what we call the Septuagint. Okay? And they were more familiar with the Septuagint. Very few of them could even speak Hebrew at that time. They spoke Yiddish or, or Aramaic. But very few of them could speak Biblical Greek. Matter of fact, they are not Greek, but Hebrew. They didn't know. When Jesus quoted Psalm 22 and verse 1 on the, on the cross, the law of the law of the they didn't know what he was saying. They thought he was calling for Elijah. He said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He was quoting Scripture because he was fulfilling Scripture. Well, after the Greek Empire rose and fell, then came the Roman Empire. And the Romans had a philosophy of life that was different than, than what even America today, in some ways. Every country that they conquered, or was a satellite country now, they allowed them to worship their own God. They didn't try to evangelize them, they didn't try to change them in any way. They could just go on and live their lives the way they did, 
but they expected them to help them in time of war, and they paid taxes. And uh, and all of this, this is all they expected out of them. I mean, they were very tolerant of areas, but if you didn't do what they told you to do, the basic things, to the cross you went. And that was a bad death, because they wanted to make it as bad as it could be. They wanted you to suffer for days before you died. And they crucified any criminals like that. But they allowed any country that they conquered to have their own religion put on their own. But they needed to also recognize Rome. <coughs> and the God that they believed in. I mean, you can believe whatever you want to, but just, just, you don't have to believe it, but just recognize that we have a God and we have a nation. And <coughs> that's what we want you to do. Well, wherever Israel was in the world, let's think about that. Wherever Israel was in the world, they didn't want to have nothing to do with any foreign gods anymore, did they? You ought to read Pontius Pilate's letter to Caesar about the Jews in his day. After World War II, they didn't want any part of other lands. No. Hitler made them so sick. <laughs> God used that man, that rascal. God used Hitler to make Israel want to go home. He used Nebuchadnezzar. He used some, many of those Antiochus Epiphanes he even used to make Israel want to go back home. Well, because of the rights that, and the separation, what do you read in the Law of Moses? We're covering all this, recapping all of what we learned for the last 150 lessons. Okay? What does the law of Moses teach you? That we're no good. Huh? We're no good. We well, that, we're, that we're, we need to sacrifice. But what does it tell you? What's the main thing there? When, when Israel went into the promised land, what was the main thing? <coughs> Do not compromise. <coughs> Be ye separate. For I am the Lord your God, and I am a jealous God. <clears throat> now just think just a little bit. If you were a spiritual leader in Israel now, or any place else in Africa, or any place else in the world, and you had Jews in your synagogue, wherever you were, and the local authorities had uh, celebrations. All of their God, whatever it might be. And you were a governor of that province or a mayor of that city and you were a Jew. According to Jewish law, could you go and have anything to do with this celebration? They made the whole world mad at them. You know that? They made the world mad. They thought that they were anti-human. They were the most egotistical people in the world. They thought that they had the only rules and plan and everything else was no good. They're going to live in our land and tell us we're wrong? <laughs> You're living in our country and telling us we're wrong? Where should have Israel been in the first place? Where were they supposed to be? Palestine. If they had gone into Palestine and done exactly what they were supposed to do, then they would have been witnesses for all the world. Because God would have blessed them. And this idea of eudaimonia, the whole world knew what that was. That's the good, the good spirits are for you. They're blessing you. If somebody had terrible times and a nation fell, they think, well, you know, either our gods or somebody else's gods were displeased with what we're doing, see. You see that? Well, you, Josephus uses those terms. And he says, when the Roman government came into, into power and during my time, and he finally up and says, God used Rome to chastise Israel because we were going the wrong way. And sometimes God, in time, He allows nations to come up. And He names all of these nations back during this period of time that God used. The Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar and uh, 
All of the, all of the kings, Antiochus, Epiphanes, he names all of these and he said, look what God did to his nation because they weren't walking the right way. He said, and there was something else that Jews, you know, they were kind of fearful where they walked among the other people. But if there were good Jewish rabbis in the area, did you know that they always made sacrifices in the name of the governor or the state, wherever they lived? And they would, on the Day of Atonement, they'd say, God, we're making atonement for our leaders here. They don't, don't know everything about you, but we're, this lamb we're sacrificing right here, we're going to sacrifice for them. We're going to pray for them so they can let us live here. Paul got some of that in Romans the 13th chapter, didn't he? When we were supposed to pray for the leaders. Okay? That we can coexist with them. Do you pray for them to get out of the way? or <laughs> <laughs> Do something, knock them in the head, or some bomb hits them, or whatever, you know, sometimes. And some of them are bad. But Israel was supposed to do that. And during the revolution in the, the state of Israel, during after Christ's death. The priests were up there getting ready to make a sacrifice for the Roman rulers and the Roman nation. And these Jewish rebels came in there and killed every priest right on holy ground. They had already killed the Messiah anyway. But now Israel rebelled. That, that uh, absolute antagonistic element came in there and killed all of the priests that were going to make sacrifices for the Roman government. They killed them all and they revolted and they went to some different Galilee all over the road revolting. And Josephus tells us about that. He said, we really as a nation, we try to coexist. God teaches us to coexist wherever we are. But these people killed their own priests. Because we were praying for you. And God has always called us to pray for others. Well, isn't that what the Bible teaches us today? Pray. Isn't that what Jesus said? As we come through time, we, we see the Lord calling out His church in His own ministry. He was ready to change the administration from Israel to a new people. And that's where you come in. You old Gentile. You know what Gentile is? What does that mean? Gentile. Anything but a Jew. A Gentile is a dog. Do you know that? Profane. Unholy. Unclean. Us unclean people became the administrators in God's kingdom. How wonderful. How, how far are they out there? What are they doing, Brother Bill? Looks like they're praying. Looks like they're praying. Thank you. Next week we're going to get in. I've got a book for you too. I, I, I can't get one out of the car. Uh, they're asleep. <laughs> <laughs> you think they want all to sleep? Well, it's almost sleepy day, brother. Any, anyway, anyway, thank you for your attention. I hope you, I hope you learned something as we study God's eternal purpose. And you can get all the tapes on these things. I've got them all taped if you want any of those or any special classes you have in the past. And uh, uh, Brother Greg, I want you to come up. And, and uh, if you got any prayer requests, yes, sir. <coughs> And I want to start with you. Uh, I'm sorry I didn't get Mark's request last week. Oh yeah, he's um he's he's interviewing with the church.